Hello. Welcome to another episode of Daily Wisdom Words Podcast. I am your host, Rene O'Day. Daily Wisdom Words is an online community for writers and poets all over the world. Join us every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we will be talking to some very distinguished guests, each one specializing in topics you don't want to miss. Hey, everyone. I am Neil Trevi, and I will be your co-host today. I want to thank everyone for joining us and give a very warm welcome to another episode of the Daily Wisdom Words Podcast. We're both excited to be here every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific. We also want to give a shout out to all the Daily Wisdom Words members who are listening today. Want an exclusive sneak peek at our future guests? Go to our website, dailywisdomwords.com, where you'll have full access to our podcast page, which is updated every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The link of the podcast page is posted in the description. Not on that page, not only will you see who the upcoming guest is, but you'll also be able to submit a question and any feedback and suggestions you have for the podcast. We want to hear from you. Today, we have web designer from the company Wink Media, Matthew Arnold. I almost said Michael. Matthew you are Arnold. all good. Okay, hey, y'all. Thank you. So thank good. you for letting me hey. be here. Yeah, welcome to our show. So. Uh, welcome to the show, Matthew. How are you? I am doing just fine. You know, another uh, awesome. lovely morning. Good. Glad to hear. Um, so this is the first time we've met, obviously, and I don't know a lot about you. Can you tell us uh, a bit about how you got interested in design and ultimately how it became your career? Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> let's see. I don't actually, we'll make one clarification. I'm not actually a web designer for any words. Um, I work for a couple of companies. The one how I was able to work with Daily Wisdom Words before is the website company. So for that, I'm actually nothing more than an account manager. So right for those is I just deal with each of the clients and take care of all their needs and make sure that everything they have is being addressed in some you know, timely manner and they're getting what they want done. Um, I wish I was a designer. I dabble. And I still do, I do <laughs> web design work and I do other design work on the side. Um, however, that is much more of a uh, freelance hobby or um, people like to ask me to do tasks, I guess, that aren't my job, but are always fun to learn. So I learned well, it. it's never I mean, too like late. See, no, God, no. I love learning yeah. new ones. Perks of having ADD. We always oh. learn something new. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I see. yes, okay. it's a, it's a, it's a solid gift and curse, but uh, high functioning, I guess, for that matter. Um, I mean, well, how I'll... far back y'all want to know? I mean, you talking, you know, well, you guys want to go yeah, childhood, part of your career is, stuff, like, how feeling? did you, how did you decide like that? Okay. This is, this is the area in which you sort of want to go in and, and want to make it your, your living, I guess. Want to uh, make a living sheer, that way. Sheer dumb luck actually is probably the real answer. Um, okay. I got my undergrad in international marketing in 2011. Hmm. And then I worked in some high tech sales in California when I got out of there, um, did miserably, actually terrible. I really? <laughs> uh, didn't, didn't take it seriously, was caught up in a lot of other, um, unsavory addictions at the time. And, uh, you know, went through two BMWs in the course of like six months and really was not a responsible wow. individual at, you know, 23. Let's be honest, I was 23 and making more money than I should have made. Um, And then I actually decided to drop everything and go and try to cook. So I actually talked my way into a kitchen and became a dishwasher because I had never cooked a day in my life outside of like home. And I went from being a dishwasher to an executive chef over the next nine years. So I was a chef for about a decade. Oh. I have a son wow. that's a chef. Yeah, it was wonderful. No, never classically trained. Yeah. All just working in kitchens and my own dedication. Um, my wife now was classically trained at oh. one point earlier, so she's actually classically right. French trained and has her degree in culinary arts. Whereas did mine she go to Lake Cordon Bleu? Um, no, she went to a school okay. in San Francisco that I could not actually tell you the name of it. Hmm. 
we met after she'd become a chef. So I don't actually know where she did. She went to her culinary degree. Um, and then let's see. Then I couldn't get out of being a chef. Honestly, it was the biggest problem. <laughs> I did it nine years and I couldn't find anyone else who would take me seriously, even though I grew up in high tech. Um, my mother is a project manager for medical technologies and uh, specializing in like startup companies. And she gets them from like, you know, off the ground and up to actually high production volume. Um, that's her specialty. And then my father is a printed circuit board design engineer. So I grew up in that kind of realm and I couldn't get out of being a cook, which was obnoxious because I lived in Silicon Valley at the time. So I went and got started getting my MBA. And then right when I was finishing my MBA, I just happened to find a part-time, I don't know what it was considered office assistant, I think is when I started working for the web design company. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was lucky enough to have him take me on and it just started doing that part time is supposed to be an office assistant. And it kind of all just rolled downhill from there. I had no idea. <laughs> I'd never done anything on it. I'd never done anything wow. so there. <laughs> I, ne- I had no idea what it was, but business is my background. So it quickly evolved into, you know, I was, yeah. I just became his number two and, you know, he was the main focal point. He was the, des- you know, the designer, the developer, like he knew all of the technicalities. And my job yeah. was to just learn as much as I could and make sure his customers had the best experience, which by default, I ended up learning a good chunk of it. Right. So I am That's amateur, fantastic. amateur developer, well, amateur designer. You know, <laughs> I have three kids and I tell them, find your passion and then get a uh, minor in business because you can never go wrong with a business degree. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those weird points, right? Where like, uh, by the time you graduate, it's all, it's all useless to be honest, right? But all the things you learn. So like, it doesn't matter by the time you spend four years in there, any industry mm-hmm. has changed so many times, mm. whatever yeah. it was. Tech, what, is yeah. it, Moore's, what is it? Moore's law, Moore's law doubling every 18 mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As I yes. think the one it is. So it's so by the time you're out, it's useless. But it, as long as you actually have a decent set of professors who can teach you critical thinking or mm-hmm. anything that is um you can just understand and take in new stimuli and process it and then be mm-hmm. able to make an educated decision. That was the one. I've gotten lucky. I've gotten very right. lucky through education. I've always had great teachers through sheer luck. Wow. That's, That's really awesome. Great. Yeah. Well so, so um that I'm sorry, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I remember one time when uh, we were working with you via Daily Wisdom Words, and we had a one-on-one conversation, very interesting one, uh, something similar, a similar topic to what we were just talking about, and that is being passionate about a profession versus being practical. Like you said, everything just keeps on changing every day. In your opinion, what what which aspect is more important to you? Is it more important to be practical and make sure that, okay, bills are being paid, food is being on the table or follow something that you're extremely passionate about or can it, can the two be balanced out? Uh, that is a loaded question all the way through. Um, honestly, well, it's one of those pieces. Okay. We'll use this obviously in my opinions all the way through your, here. your personal. Opinion, um, yeah. Yeah, you you okay. don't get an option when you don't. You're not a high income earner, right? Like you, there are certain times in your life when you don't get the freedom to do what you want to be doing. And you know, the sad truth of this all is, rarely do you get to always make exclusive decisions based on what you want versus having away some other need or the need of another individual. Um, right. Like when we talked earlier, like I was able to take the risk of going from, you know, high tech sales into being a dishwasher, which <laughs> did not pay. <laughs> Let me tell you, um, well, being a chef, you weren't period, making $50 pay. an hour. <laughs> oh my Lord. Even in California, we were making <laughs> I know, right? some poverty numbers. Um, <laughs> but no, that was just one of the ones where I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do that. And I did, but again, I had no one at the time. I, I had, there was no responsibility that I needed to uphold. You know, I had dated people while I was a cook, but like I had no, no mortgage, no, no, my equivalent now of a flood insurance. You know, I wasn't engaged. I wasn't trying to plan, you know, a long form life. And, you know, 
eh, it was one of those, but you'd like to, the way I look at it and the way that I was taught growing up is you're never going to get to make the 100% uh, follow your passion decision. So you're better off finding aspects that you're motivated by and trying to balance it through there, right? Like my, I prefer to talk, obviously. Um, and I like to be able to, I like to be able to like chat, you know, chat with people, I like to be able to be on the phone, be in the calls, go drive and see right. them. Um, I'm not an individual who could be like my, uh, one of my bosses who's a web developer, right? He could lock himself in a room and write code out for 10 hours and be absolutely happy about it. Um, just a different mechanism that I operate through. So all I did now is, but it's also very difficult, right? If you, all you want to do is talk to people and you want to work with them and you want to help them, you have infinite options now because you can do that anyway. Right. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you choose to do. You could go and decide to really jump in and make it a charitable association, you know, you try to go that direction. Um, so it was really just one of those pieces where I've sheer dumb luck is how I've been able to find jobs, honestly, through my entire life is, I take the risk and I walk into some place and I do it old school. I walk in and try to talk my way into it, um, wow. which doesn't really work Love so it. much anymore. Um, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. They will literally, they will literally send you right out and tell you to go apply online. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I found most of mine, all the jobs, I've worked a lot of jobs over the years. Um, right. Habit of also having no, when your skill set is not technical, Right. If you're a technical based individual and that's your skill set, then you can focus. My skill set is eh, people. Honestly, I just like to hang out with people and talk with people and figure out how whatever I'm currently working on, I can make better for them. So it was, it's all been sheer luck on my end, which has been a nothing but a blessing. Yeah. But it's one of those where mine particularly was I could change, I could choose my passion as long as, and I made it very clear with my, my current job that like, I don't want my world dependent on like sales or something, right? Like I don't like my entire income and all of that tied to my ability to sell something because then right. I feel pressured to make the sale and yeah. then everything is relying on it. And I don't feel that like there's an honest communication with people when you're doing that because you're mm -hmm. always in the back of their mind as well as the back of yours. There's always this, well, wait, wait for the sales pitch. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Right. And I just, I didn't like that. So that's why I like doing accounts management. Now I will still do sales but right. it's not tied to me professionally, right? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just an extra. I don't care if it's got, you know, no cap, I can earn all I want, like that kind of stuff. It doesn't, uh, right. there's no it's motivation. Like commission, no well, commission it, for based. me, yeah. it doesn't motivate me. It actually demotivates right. me. It actually oh. makes me perform less <laughs> because I have to think that everything is now tied to it. And now I'm stressed yeah. thinking yeah. about what I'm saying. So as soon as you remove that stress, then it becomes something where I can just sit down like this and have a conversation and meet people for the first time and, you know, see where the world goes yeah well i couldn't sell pencils to a teacher i'd end up buying <laughs> them and then just giving them because i hate sales so we're a lot of like most people do <laughs> most I people mean, do like, hate sales you know would you like to buy these pencils oh no 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 oh never mind here here just take them just take them <laughs> but um i've actually so had that the, the I've, really had, I've worked with somebody i worked with somebody too. before who was well off and uh, Sue's family was well off. And in order to meet their sales numbers, would actually buy the products mm -hmm. uh, using like a family, mm -hmm. like a family credit card to maintain their, their level. So they never drop down. If they had a bad month, they would just pretty much pay for their own products so that would keep their month, their monthly up. And that's just a stress wow. that seems weird to me. Yeah. Well, I, I did it with Girl Scout cookies for my daughter, but that's about it. Um, <laughs> oh, those things sell themselves. I know, right? Hey, those girls, those girls who figured out to go put them in front of all of those uh, marijuana dispensaries, those girls figured it out. <laughs> those yeah, go. that is true. That is true. So, um, if let's just say, um, like you had, you know, met someone that wanted to become uh, a web designer, though you say you don't design, but no. Um, how would you recommend them going about it? Because like you said, every 18 months, it's a different ball game. Um, in, in websites, particularly what I've been able to learn from that one is you're much better off. It depends on really the skill set, but to be fair, you're really much better off trying to freelance first, mm -hmm. because if you can't freelance, 
you're also going to be really, it's not, it's going to be a real struggle for you once you actually try to do it. And it's like your full-time job, like in a corporate. Um, and that's just because freelance exposes you to absolute chaos, right? You have to right. support your own work. You have to be confident in your own work. You have to take the risk of submitting your work to people who may or may not like it. And you have to be very comfortable with creating things that you're personally attached to that may not be what the person actually wants. And there's a, there's always a web uh, joke, especially yeah. in development in the development world um, that when you get from the customer who would then tell me what they want as an account manager. And then by the time I tell, as you know, a project manager, we put together all the details, that project manager then assigns that and it gets into, you know, either the design team has to go through it first. And then after the design team gets approved, it goes to development. And by the time development gets it in the, client can finally see it and it's been anywhere from two weeks to six months by the time they can uh, see something it just depends on the project right um, right it, it's you know someone started asking for a, a stick figure doll and you ended up you know creating a you know anything it could be so abstract you end up creating like a plant like it just <laughs> it things get really caught yeah. with the number of iterations and the number of interpretations that come through Right. So you have to really, you got to take it on the chin as a lot as, as a developer and a designer, you get abused. So that's wow. why I like I freelance, freelance. Yeah, yeah. You get, it's just, it's and customers without saying customers suck, but like right. customers suck sometimes <laughs> because they just, they don't know what they want, <laughs> but they think they know what they want. And yeah. even though they would never let you tell them how to do their job, they're really comfortable telling you how to do yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so we yeah. run into that I run into that yeah. all the time with any number right. of clients and so they're like I want to fix this issue right I want a form that will collect information that we can then use for targeted marketing later it's like okay right. here's the form we designed that will work in our opinion the best well I don't like that form can you move this button over here and can you move this over <laughs> here and can we change the color on this and can we put it on a totally different page and you're like well at that point I can't guarantee results for you Right. You've, you've taken it entirely out of our realm of our expertise, made it yours. Yeah. And then three months from now, don't get me wrong, you will guarantee come back to me and tell me it didn't perform. How dare you? <laughs> it was terrible. I can't believe we paid you to do this work. And you're like, well, you paid yeah. me to do something and then you did it yourself. So mm -hmm. I don't know how to tell you. So I've learned to get really ahead of that. And I will, mm -hmm. first time someone starts telling me the anything against our opinion, I'll tell them it's mm -hmm. not going to work. And that I, right. it, it, as unfortunate as it is, I'm not going to do the work for them or that we're not mm -hmm. going to guarantee the results that I will do the work, but I'm going to be very open that I won't even make my team start the process right? unless they acknowledge the fact that it's not. Because if you start dissecting my work, I can't be responsible for it, but inevitably they will always come back and find you. Yeah. No, never well, my so designers, never my developers, but me. Yeah. Well, so basically you're saying, listen to you. I mean, you're the expert, you're the guy, that's what they hire you for. And you know, you're gonna get the best product from you, not them, right? And it's, it's definitely one of the situations where you have to, it comes with practice um, for any, like anything, right? Um, and which is usually why you separate designers and developers in the webs field from customers. Mm -hmm. right? And you, you do that generally because the designers and developers are very artistic and they're, they're attached to their work mm -hmm. and it's difficult yeah. to take critical feedback on it. And it, it sucks to do because they may give you an absolutely stellar product. Mm -hmm. And then you may immediately have to tell them that's not what the customer wants. But then again, this is business. So yeah. I, regardless of being an expert, I got to pay the bills. I got to keep the lights on and we got to move forward sure. each day. So you have to really play this balancing game of saying, hey, give them the customer what they want, but then also you got to stand your own ground and be, you know, you got to be strong enough to say, I'm not going to do that work for you, which right. not everybody gets that luxury. I mean, that just doesn't yeah. work, right? We were a small company. I've done projects for customers who we will not name. Um, and yeah, you just, you just, you get to these points where, you want to tell them no, but the money is, is too good. And mm. so you have no option, but to kind of just really question your own business ethics in the process. And that's never right. a comfortable situation to do. 
Yeah. Um, but sometimes again, to your point earlier, like we were discussing, right. Your passion versus practicality. As yeah. much as I want to be able to tell that unsavory customer that, you know, they can go kick rocks and I don't want to do their work. You dangle enough money in front of me and uh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to find a way to do some of that work. And cook them dinner. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. If, if it's possible, but so, it's just, it's just one of the situations where you have to really, that's why there's, that's why I think there's a different in specialty. People like to try to cut out. It's actually very common to cut out what the equivalent of my position in a lot of businesses as they get bigger. Right. Um, yeah. Small companies almost always ignore it. And then you start to do it in the middle and then you get big enough and they start to think that they don't need the, oh, I don't need to be paying to fly this person out to Minneapolis. I don't need to pay to fly this person out to, you know, Austin, Texas, because I'm just wasting all this time. But it's like, yes, I understand. It's like, it's, it's like the same thing with marketing, right? It's the first thing to always get cut because you can't directly see its result. It doesn't show up as a line item that says we earned this much money. It always says we cost you this much money. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of the things that's yeah. always cut first. Uh, mm. But you know, it depends on the business culture and you learn really quickly that it's a, it's a different gift. And I'm lucky enough to have bosses and the companies that I work for that right. understand that they don't want to be the one to talk to the customers. They understand that's not their strength. They understand mm -hmm. that there needs to be a buffer between them because they themselves will get frustrated and irritated right. and they will take it personally, right? They, they put in time. I mean, like yeah. anyone's art, you, you guys and all your writing, right? It's difficult to take critical feedback in anything, period. That's yeah. a life skill. Right. I mean, so, it, it, yeah. my generation is probably one of the, you know, last even learn it. And even my generation was poor at being taught it. But critical feedback yeah. is something that unless you played, you know, competitive sports, you did something hyper competitive as a young, and I'm not talking like rec sports where everyone's getting trophies. I mean, like right. where you learn to lose, where you learn to take feedback and you have to take it on the chin and say, am I motivated to do better tomorrow? Right. And if you don't learn how to do that, it, you know, as we're seeing now, it comes up. It's, yeah. there's an entire generation of individuals that, and again, my own opinion on it all, each individual themselves is totally worth it and totally has value intrinsically, right? That's part of the human rights that we all stand behind, right? You intrinsically have value, but there is right. a point where when do yours trump others and yeah. the, the, the answer is supposed to be never mm. right you don't mm -hmm. you don't ever have a right that is greater than another individual's intrinsic human rights um they're equal so it becomes one of those points and so that because we have a generation now that's growing up that's doing things like well that made me feel bad it's like well yeah and and the wise words <laughs> of right. uh, and the wise words of my wife uh shame is one hell of a motivator Mm -hmm. um, if you want to, exactly. if you want to learn it, yeah. it, failing is one mm -hmm. hell of a motivator and not wanting to fail is a motivator and you need to be able to mm -hmm. fail. And it's a difficult thing on my end. It took me a long time until I got sober. I never, never, ever, ever was able to do it. Well, I was naturally gifted and did everything well. And if I couldn't do it well, I didn't. Matthew, do it. <laughs> I think that, um, I think that you touched on something really, really important in your, uh, and your last reply is that I think we've done the world a disservice by giving every kid a trophy instead of teaching them how to work harder and be stronger. So next time they win, next time they can work harder to win to get that trophy. Do you know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's part of the natural, it, it's this weird, hmm, let's see, we're going to put this. It's PC culture. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's I mean, yes. part of it, right? Or, At least well, it's it. not so much PC culture that I'm worried about. It's trying not to cuss. Um, again, 10 years in kitchens is, right. is a hard habit to, is to break out on me as far as language. Um, oh shit. You worked in, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm much worse. I normally have to put it, it takes me a moment to get it back out. Um, I know. No, it's one of those where it, it's understandable to want equity and equality, right? It's very understandable is it understand that. And of course things are unfair, right? Of course they are. And it's very understandable and it's very altruistic sounding to say, well, let's all be equal. But like, mm -hmm. then you run into the difficult question of who's equal, right? Like, are we, are we all coming up or are we all going down? And mm -hmm. it's yeah. just the natural order of things is to always go down. 
Mm-hmm. It just it just happens to be that. I mean, there's a there's a stat that they use in the military that when they do IQ testing, if you have anything lower than an 80 IQ, the military will not take you. So what they've done is, and this is the military, right? So they need anybody that they could possibly take. They're not picky. They have very few rules that say we are not going to take this body to help us, you know, in our military. This is the U.S. military, largest in the world. We will take anything we can. But even our military has a few rules that say, no, there is nothing we could possibly teach an individual who has an intelligence lower than 80 and an IQ score. And, and, and simply from that, that means that even the bare minimum, there, there is some level of a minimum that says you can't actually function to do something. Even if we, we pay you, give you all the supplies, give you all the training, there is, there's an, there's an intrinsic blocking that will happen if you can't at least process to a a minimum level. So when we're talking about equality, which again, can totally understand, I've lived in two other third world countries, um, one communist, one half dictator. Um, my wife is from a dictator's commun, you know, is from an actual communist dictatorship in Nicaragua. I've lived in Cuba and oh. the Dominican Republic. So in, until you, you see what equality means, equality never ends up being equality, right? It just never ends there. So as well as it sounds great, and I can understand the sentiment of wanting to be equal, right? Of wanting to have what other people have and have everyone on a level playing field. And while that is wonderful, in theory, it's the act of getting it to actually happen that is just impossible because someone has to set the standard. So then whose standard did you pick, right? By default, we have already eliminated equality by allowing one person or a group of individuals, small minority, to decide what is considered equal. You've immediately Mm -hmm. already started the hierarchy again. It Mm -hmm. already starts from the first second you start about equality, you have broken it. So it's just, it's just a, it's just a rational flaw that every single time you try to get equality, it is impossible to reach because as soon as you set standards, you have already broken it. So you can't, you can never measure it. That's why you always enter no matter what. That's why there's never been a form of, pure socialism that has worked. There's never no. been a form of communism that has worked. Now there are, no. and as most will argue, right? Oh, there are some that are partially socialist. And that's true. They do have socialist tendencies. European countries are much better at doing it. Um, but at the same time, they also grew up under oligarchies. They grew up under monarchies. Like they're, they're used to being all of us down here, a little bit up here, and they're okay with the greater good. It's an ideology they're okay with. Um, it is not, cool. however, one in this country, which is why everyone thinks the U.S. is crazy. It's just not <laughs> every other. It, well, it, it, yeah, it's understandable. Yeah. I had this conversation the other day mm-hmm. with one of my other reps, and it's understandable that everyone thinks the U.S. is crazy. Like, I can get it. I can get it. We're the only country that says you can say whatever you want, and nobody can tell you that you're wrong, right? Freedom of speech across the board, it doesn't matter. I can make those decisions and I can say things that I want, no matter what. Even if it's dumb, I have the right to be an idiot. <laughs> and that's just intrinsically built into our existence. We're allowed to mm-hmm. be, and that's how it is. Yeah. And then we also built in a revolution clause, the Second Amendment. Mm-hmm. Right? We're the only country in the world that says, not only do you have the right to bear arms, the government is restricted from ever taking them from you, and literally, we would burn the entire place to the ground using the weapons that you're not allowed to take from me, rather mm-hmm. than ever let you have a say in what we can and cannot do. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a reason why you can, some of the policies that people like, or they like to point at the European models and say, well, we could do those here. And it's like, yes, but we literally just don't have a document that supports it. And again, yeah. it's not, it's not a, a preference of something of mine that says, oh, this is my belief versus this is, you know, against your belief. It's if you just look at the founding document, regardless of your opinions politically, it just doesn't make for a path that says our government should be large mm. and that yeah. it should dictate what you choose to do. And it, it, it comes off as sounding extremely conservative, but I mean, I've literally lived as a poor person off of three cents in a communist country. I grew up in California yeah. in the second most liberal city in all of California and Santa Cruz. Um, I've been exposed to a lot across the board and this is nothing to do with conservatism or liberalism. It's simply, if you understand how we are founded and how we are 100% unique to anyone else, there's a reason why we look crazy. And I, again, I agree or disagree is not the point. It's, it makes right, sense right. is why is, you'll never get away with it. 
It just, it won't happen. There'll always be people who are upset here. It just well, power is a it's hard addiction to break. Power yeah. is a hard addiction to break. So well, we're naturally inclined be... to want to be better than the person next to us. Right. Exactly. You and then we're back to, we're back to equality. It doesn't matter. Right? You're <laughs> naturally inclined to want to be better than the person next to you. It's natural yeah. Yeah. to be it as there is no, there's no human instinct that says, I don't want to be good. Right. You mm -hmm. want to be valued by the people around mm -hmm. you, by yourself. You need exactly. to look yourself in the mirror. You want to be valued by your, you yeah. know, your family. You want to be valued by your neighbors, your city. You know, you want to be part of this community and you will do anything to show that you are valuable. Even right. if it makes changing who you are in order to fit a mold that makes you feel better. But so you should always a... value yourself first. I mean, I, I learned the hard way. But, you know, if you don't love yourself first, then nobody else really is going to ever really love you. Anyway. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even <laughs> you know, go as far as topic. to say you have to love yourself. I would just say you, you have to be, again, to your point, Respect. you have to look yourself in the mirror. Well, you got to mm -hmm. look yourself in the mirror. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Relationships are what make us human. So you need to maintain a level of socialization and you need to maintain a level of some people around you and be able to do those things and be able to, and, and the clinical sign of a sociopath is somebody who can't get along mm -hmm. with other people. And yeah. we're actually, humans actually have a, ironically enough, we have a sociopath detector built into us. Um, right. We can actually mm -hmm. tell if another individual is off. Um, it's something that's built Shh, into us. Don't tell Neil. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it really is. It is a weird thing. And it's something that's come mm. over, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. It's just, it's come up. We've, we've been able to tell when somebody in the group isn't being truthful and honest. Mm -hmm. And you may not know, we mm -hmm. call it intuition these days, right? Like we've given it mm -hmm. its own little term. Um, mm -hmm. We just can't explain it, but we know we feel odd. And, and it's built into us. But lights, to be mm -hmm. fair, uh, sociopaths, their one usual skill is being able to lie to other people. So, you know, yeah. in the right group, they also thrive quite well. But on the long term, they always fail. Right. In short term, they do really well and they're True. very successful, actually. Yeah. Statistically, True. sociopaths do really well in the short term. They're very yeah. hyper successful. They can climb corporate ladders. They can blend into everything. They can become part of multiple social groups. They do really well. But if you historically right. track them, you will notice that they don't stay in one place long. They don't stay in one group long. They do. They don't hold long-term friends um, because they, time is usually the issue that you run into with the sociology one. Yeah. Sorry, my no, undergrad well-being and marketing had to focus. That on was amazing. Psychology. Well, it has to focus on psychology. So amazing. all of my yeah, all of my undergrad stuff is in religion and psychology and sociology. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. But I mean. Um, as we went on earlier at right, the intelligence piece, right? It was that even the military says, if you want equality, it doesn't matter, right? There is still a bare level of minimum of intelligence that a person needs to be able to compete. And I think it's like one tenth or one sixth, something, something down like there of the population is below like an 80. Like there is literally an actually awkwardly large percentage of the population does not possess mm. an IQ high enough to even be qualified <laughs> in the military. Yeah. I don't think yeah. I want a guy with an 80 uh, IQ with a gun in his hand. I don't know. That could just be me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not so much the gun. It's not no. so much the gun you have to worry about. It's uh, the decision making with the gun. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. It's never the what gun. It's never the gun. gun. Yeah. yeah. It's never yeah. the gun that pulls itself. Right. It's, it's never, yeah. no gun yeah. has ever shot anybody. Uh, somebody was always behind that decision. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's always exactly. the decision-making capabilities. Yeah. And that could be went to earlier if you want to make it a total full circle, right? It's back to the critical thinking. If you can teach people to critically think, then they can take on new and even dangerous stimuli and make safe decisions. But if you can't teach them to critically think, then right. you know, we're back to square well, one. You know, they're they're exactly. just as dangerous as anything else. Exactly. Critical yeah. thinking is the most important thing you can teach someone. Exactly. You want to play, you want to play nature versus nurture. Or, you want to play nature yeah, versus nature. nurture. Yeah. They've, been, yeah. <laughs> they've yeah. been trying to figure that one out for a long time. Uh, notice how we, we still had, don't have that answer yet. Yeah, we, we had a doctor, uh, Dr. Hire on who, uh, who <laughs> talked about, you know, the brain and genius and, and all yeah. that. And we don't have it figured out. Yeah. No, and, we and don't you, even get you a can't. great answer from him. Yeah. 
though. Well, and you can, we you did not. can't. There's yeah. too many. It's it's multivariable across the board at all times. So it doesn't right. matter anymore, right? Like you'll never get a concrete answer because one, just due to the infinite variability of the human race. And then right. each time we reproduce the species, you've now created a new infinite variability like problem. It just becomes an issue quickly to say, oh, yeah. it was very particularly this one aspect that did it. And right. you can you can never get there, right? And I'll speak of my own case, I'm naturally gifted. So I have ADD, which again, I didn't even really find out that they tried to put me on medication for ADD when I was like five or six uh, until like last year or maybe even this year. My mother just randomly goes, oh yeah, the teacher tried to put you on meds when you were like six. And I was wow. like, oh, well, thank you for not letting them. Exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, again, I'm, again, I'm naturally gifted and then like high functioning. So in my particular case, my mother's answer, and God bless her for this, the greatest thing she probably could have ever done for me, was just tell my teachers to kick rocks and give me more work. I just like, he's bored. Do more. Just give him mm -hmm. more, even if it's more than other students, even if it's not fair, right? We had a conversation about fairness earlier, right? Even if it's right. not fair, give him more work and you will find that mm -hmm. it'll, he'll figure it out. So right. mm -hmm. for education, for me in education is I can do anything at an 80% with almost zero effort. I can get right. to zero, no understanding to 80% really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Not to like, you know, boost my own ego. It's just, I can do things pretty easily. Um, mm -hmm. Getting from that 80% up to mastery though, extremely rare yeah. for me. Extremely rare for uh -huh. me to ever get to the mastery aspect of it. Because I just I don't have the attention span to go that far. Um, so crazy. I can do things yeah. really well. And then very few have I ever, ever taken beyond being naturally gifted at it. So for education, for me, in second grade, they were like, okay, well, then we'll put you in a combo class, right? Second and third graders. So in second mm -hmm. grade, I did second grade work and third grade work. I did mm -hmm. both of the grades in second grade. And then I still had to go into third grade next year because I didn't get, they didn't count my credit. Plus my parents didn't want me to skip. Uh -huh. They wanted me to just keep doing more work. Yeah. Um, and then I did the same for fourth and fifth when I was younger. And so I, in a fourth grade, I did fourth grade work and then I did fifth grade work simultaneously and did both those years in one just so I had work to be doing. And I've excelled in education because I was able to find something to do. My parents were also really good about it. They understood right. that I needed to be doing something. So I did summer school as a kid. I, it was something where most kids, you know, summer school is a punishment. I didn't even realize it was a punishment until I was in like high school. Right. That like, really? that's what you, that's where bad yeah. kids go. Yeah. My parents, wow. I was lucky enough that I would, they would send me to a, a summer camp that was half the day was school. And then the mm. second half was some activity based. Mm. Um, and we were lucky enough to have the available resources near us to where we could do, I could do like horseback riding or like um, wood shop or weird science classes or something like that to, you know, balance actual skills and something creative and something else to be doing mm -hmm. that actually is like some life skills to be learning and how to like handle different situations. But I did, right. yeah, I did school for a number of years um, in the summer. It's just a way. Wow. Um, and then I just never, and I've, school's always been great. I like to learn, right? It, it, we said nature versus nurture. Nobody uh -huh. taught me to like to learn. So like, that's just, right. an, that's, that's an intrinsic value that I just have. I love to learn it. That's why we talked earlier. No, I'm not a right. designer. Um, but for one of my jobs I currently hold, I've made like 47 pieces of digital collateral for them where it's all about either posters or vertical banners or flyers or designing logos and all that kind of weird stuff. I just picked that up and learned how to do it. I don't know how to use the very sophisticated tools that most designers know. Um, honestly, I'm not even educated enough to know what the sophisticated hardcore tools are that they use. Um, mm -hmm. But I found, I found some basic ones that I've been able to, again, accomplish from 0% to 80 percent effectiveness really well right. um and that is much more of something that came you know naturally i just have always been able to do it and i've always been able and always been interested in learning anything and everything now the interest in learning though i guess will nurture right both my parents are smart like off the scale smart individuals my father is similar to me who's just absolutely astronomically smart and hated school actually my father while dating oh. good at school did not go far in school um oh. but it's probably one of the only ones in his profession to be a college dropout who hires and fires phds regularly so May an I absolute ask profession? gifted man uh, my father is a printed circuit board design engineer <laughs> 
Oh, wow. you know, wow. got that degree out of Cracker Jacks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, he got, in his particular case, uh, yeah, when he when he moved to Silicon Valley in his 20s, he found the right relationships and was able to learn from the up and coming people in the industry who were very talented in it. And because he was naturally gifted, he was able to pick it up. And, you know, but we also come from entrepreneurs, right? So my father has done like five or six startup companies in my life um, where my mother is like a, a lifelong worker. She likes to work at one company for a long, long time. Whereas my father mm -hmm. and I are much more of a, we'll plateau. We'll Vagabond. Get bored. <laughs> uh, we'll just get bored of something. And so it needs to say interesting. So I grew up yeah. with him doing, you know, startup companies and those mm -hmm. never get boring. So I'm used to mm -hmm. it. So I like to work for smaller, particularly me, my skill set of being able to take risks, talk to people, naturally learn anything that needs to be learned, right? oh, we got this gap. We don't have the ability to do this piece of information or we don't have a designer in house. Okay, I guess I'm learning mm -hmm. how to design. Right. Um, or we don't have anybody who knows how to, I don't know, just anything. We just pick up tasks. It just, it's what happens in entrepreneurship. You have to just learn new things to keep going forward. You rarely have the financial resources. Um, right, it's just one of those games where even if you have the financial resources, you don't want to spend them because you're too worried mm -hmm. that, you know, next month could be a rough month. So mm -hmm. you just, you need, that's why usually the people who start businesses don't stay when they're mature. One of the rules of thumb I grew up with is usually you kick the, own, the, the original creator of the business out as early as possible. Oh, Especially really? If you're, doing, like that? If, you're doing, oh. if you're doing anything with like venture capitalism or actual investment, or you're going to try to take the company public, um, anything that requires absolute, emotionless, rational decisions that are meant to, you know, you're in charge of, you know, thousands of lives, tens of thousands. If you start talking about the larger companies, hundreds of thousands, right. if you get into like, you know, the really global companies and you have to remove the emotion at that point. And as we spoke earlier, right. The reason why I like to buffer my designers is they're artists. Um, right. And it's not the same skill set. And a person who can get a business off the ground is rarely the person who can sustain it into the future. And that's just, and it's rare, but it can happen, right? right? You get the Mark Zuckerbergs, you get the Elon Musks, you, you know, you get the Jeff Bezos in the world and then they make yeah. everyone think that they can become the exception to the rule. But, you know, we're talking uh, less than 10 people in a population of, you know, 8 trillion, right? <laughs> or 8 billion, whatever yeah. the heck we have on this planet now, right? So it's like, <laughs> right. there's only a handful who can do that. And it's not, it's not a statistical piece that you would bank on. But again, they're back to intelligence, right? They're in, incredibly yeah. intelligent but they got a crazy balance right they're not they have crazy intelligence they they learn continuously they never stop they're you know they're actually personable right they can stand in front of groups and people can actually support them right? they, they they're yeah. good about it but if you notice right like jeff bezos and wasn't necessarily always in charge right they got a board mm. mark zuckerberg is probably one of the ones that held on the longest but you know even then they Still, they still put them in front of Congress because they like to be the face of the company, but the actual power they wield, it starts to go down, right? Like, you know, um, you got Bill Gates, right? He wasn't even part of Microsoft the entire like back end of that. Yeah. He was nothing more than a face, right? It's you do get to a point where you need to. Right? The skill set that it takes to go from taking high risk and having and not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring you as far as food on the table and a roof over your head to growing a company into selling millions of, you know, pieces, millions of an individual product, you know, globally, they're not the same skill set. And that's why it takes, it takes a, a back to critical thinking and just feedback. Like we said earlier, right? You have to take negative criticism. Sometimes you got to learn that your, your part of everything can simply be, you can be a role player. Right. My job is right. to make sure that we get from having only a few people up to the next level where we can afford to have a much larger team. Right. But once we have a much larger team, my value really starts to diminish quickly. So, um, Matthew, we appreciate your time with us today. Uh, can you tell our audience how to find Wink Media and uh, what exactly Wink Media can do for them? Um, yes and no. Um, so we'll first caveat that any and all opinions here do not represent anything that do with my employers, 
um, or any of them or any of my bosses or anyone who's involved with those, right? This is, this is me taking some time in my own personal off the clock moment to have a chat with y'all. I'd love to have you guys awesome. as clients and I love sitting clearly. I will sit and chat y'all's ears off forever. Um, we could listen to you. Yeah, You're it very... is. It is. It is a blast for me. If you guys ever want, I will gladly do another round and we can pick another subject and I'll go. It's uh, again, back to the curse of ADD. I'm down. Um, I'm I, can, I can subject hop quite, quite easily. Um, but as far as, because we had worked with y'all before, so yep. Wink Media is a company that originally specialized in digital marketing. Um, however, we actually, again, like I said to you earlier, you have to learn where your skill sets are. And right. we've actually decided that as we've evolved, we really got good at development and making websites that don't require a lot of work and effort from service providers specifically. So we've actually shifted our focus to service providers and home service providers to give them all of the tools in a single platform that allows them to manage their business online without needing to be an expert in web, right? As you guys have learned, once you get on the back end of that website, it gets murky really quick. Oh yeah, that's um, an understatement. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it becomes very difficult, right? And it really, really yeah. does. And yeah. it's hard to spend the time to learn all of that and to be an expert in that, right? You're not, again, to our point earlier, right? you're not an expert in web. You had to learn it because it's a growing company. So right. you, you learn those pieces, but eventually you'd always wanna make sure you have a dedicated individual when you get to that, you know, that threshold. Um, so what we did is we found that exact problem is not uncommon. Um, we just happened to, in Louisiana, where there is a large, large number of home service providers, people who are plumbers and HVAC and landscapers and construction workers and contractors. I mean, we have endless numbers of them here, especially with all of the hurricanes and our weather. I mean, it's endless amounts of home work here. Uh, so we found a, we spent all the years that we did in actual websites, our founder is now in his 27th year. We finally consolidated everything into like a, a four piece platform that gives them a website that we have tested thoroughly that allows them to show up on Google, be able to be found, get ranked for the lo locations and areas that you want. You can pair that with, and we pair that right with a local SEO service that gets you listed on business directories. So that way Google's algorithm runs in a way that suggests you need to prove that your data is consistent and then it will rank you higher, right? If I have three different phone numbers listed across three different random websites, you know, three different random platforms, one different on Facebook than I have on Google than I have on, you know, uh, anywhere else doesn't matter. The phone book doesn't matter. Dude, that inconsistency will show you that you're clearly not legitimate. Um, so we put a product in there as well that unifies that. It goes out there and does that for you. You don't have to. In one dashboard, you put in all your basic information, we will go and flood everything else. And then we go and service reviews for individuals. So that way we actually go, you send us lists of your customers and we will put in the, you know, the time and energy to go get you those reviews, right? To show up on the internet, to do well, to get anything you guys do on Amazon, right? First thing you do, yeah. how many stars? First mm -hmm. thing everyone does is mm -hmm. stars yeah. and read yeah. reviews now, Absolutely. and you're all taught yeah. to do it mm -hmm. and it can make yeah. or break you. And having three reviews is not the same as having 150. I may have three mm -hmm. reviews and be five stars, but if I have 150 at a 4.2, that seems much more reasonable and that right. value looks higher. So we did is we mm -hmm. took those three basic tools and this is just from, again, from my bosses, you know, almost 30 years worth of experience and working anything from, government institutions all the way down to, you know, crazy startups that have done endless amounts of odd things to, I mean, we, we have poetry websites. Like we have literally worked with everything across the board and we finally just consolidated it all into a new platform, which we've now launched that's called Service Hawk. And that's what we're doing now is we're actually shifting our entire focus away from the custom work because mm -hmm. now we finally have found a way to help one market and it's been hyper successful and it's been wonderful to do actually because i got to take it that's why i like i like entrepreneurship <laughs> right yeah. we got to take it from being custom based to now we have been able to consolidate all of our skills and take what we've learned right it took us weeks months he had yeah. it for years it took me months of my time to break yeah. apart everything that we do and finally remove all of the pieces that were duplicate or just wasting your time or added extra energy added extra cost to both your side and our side 
right? It's mutually beneficial, of course, this is the business world. And we were able to put it all into one singular platform. So now, you know, a business owner can just say, here are the reviews that I've gotten. Make sure my business information is consistent. Here's where I'm ranking for the keywords and locations that I want to, where it's relevant to my business. And you can track that. And it's all available on a single dashboard and we control all of it. You literally just get to go and run your business, right? I don't, I'm not, I'm not out there trying to get a person who's got 500 employees, right? I want to help people mm -hmm. who've got four or not even one or two. And you need yeah. to be able to have this presence to exist in the online world. But you're not an expert, right? I don't know how to do carpentry. I'm not going to tell my plumber how to fix my toilet. <laughs> so to our conversation earlier. So, yeah. you know, we finally took all of those things that we had learned and now we put it into one and said, look, That's, we know you're not yeah. an expert in this, but we need right. you to be able to, you need to be mildly, you know, coherent. If you can run a business, you can make four or five clicks on a computer and see everything that your online world gives you as far as how your business is being represented. And that's really where our focus is now. And it's been, and it's been very successful as it's coming up now. It's still in its early phases, but I mean, I've seen nothing but stellar performances and it's been wonderful. I actually love doing it. And again, that's to your point earlier, ran, in, ran into it entirely, right? I learned this mm -hmm. and came into mm -hmm. it and it's been nothing but a blast. It's fascinating. That is absolutely yeah, that is. fascinating. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, you guys, thank, thank you, you for having me on. It's been uh, wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Next week, we have mystery writer and poet Steve Arnett joining us. Don't forget to submit a question for Steve by Wednesday of this week. To do that, visit our podcast page at the link in the description. And remember, if we pick your question to be on the show, you get a surprise gift from us. We want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you are a writer and not a member of Daily Wisdom Words, sign up today. Just $10 for a lifetime membership. No dues. Take part in our active writing prompt, our Wisdom Words blog, group to a little music, and build your own social media profile. Meet and act with other writers just like you. Once again, that's dailywisdomwords.com. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at all the links listed in the description. And don't forget to hit like on this video and subscribe to this channel so you never miss an episode. And if you want to show a little extra love to us, we also have a link for donations in the description. So thank you everyone once again, and we will see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks.